Hello and welcome to another episode of Instrumental Ramblings with me, Joe DiCeppo. Today on this episode, we are going to be covering the Horny Man Museum in South London. Yes, it's really cool that it's named after the founder, but we're all adults here, right? This out the front, by the way, is a mosaic, but it's fairly modern from the Victorian period, I believe. Inside is one of the biggest collections of musical instruments I think I've ever seen. But I've still many more museums to visit, so that record may be broken. On the left here is a shamisen, which is a traditional Japanese instrument. You can't see the square body there, but it has three silk or nowadays sometimes nylon strings. On the right is a small saz or balama um, from Turkey. This is a chogur, which is a children's one, I believe. And you can also see here the peg head of a yue chin, which is a Chinese instrument, but we'll see more of that in a bit. And here indeed is the yue chin. You can see this one has two courses of two strings each, so four in total. Uh, the strings nowadays are nylon. Historically, they probably would have been silk. Here are two Central Asian instruments. I believe these two examples are actually from Uzbekistan. On the left, you have the tambour, which is a long-necked loop from Central Asia. This one has steel strings and very high frets. Gives a particular sound because the strings are pressed down over the high frets with lots of vibrato. On the right is the duta, which is a nylon or gut stringed lute, um, long-necked lute from Central Asia, which provides the rhythmic basis for a lot of that sort of music. Now here are two reproductions of historical Renaissance instruments. On the left we have an arch lute or thorbo and on the right is a viola de gamba. Now both of these instruments I believe were built by Arnold Dolmetsch who was responsible for a lot of the early music revival in the early 20th century in England and the rest of the UK. Uh, we can also see a violin there on the right and a harpsichord that you can see here in the background. Now in the background here, you can see a set of bagpipes, but um, we don't talk about those in polite company. In the foreground here, you can see two pochettes to the right. Uh, these are smaller versions of violins, which are traditionally used for dancing. So the idea being that you can have a smaller version of a violin that you could play while dancing at the same time. Here on the left of the foreground is uh, a charango, one of my favourite instruments. This one's slightly unusual. Usually they'd have five courses of nylon strings. This one appears to have steel strings, which may make it a ponputo charango or a jonjota. This one has the traditional armadillo body, as opposed to the modern ones, which tend to be carved out of a solid block of wood. There are also some modern models made with a flat back or arched back and um, flat sides, so like a small guitar or indeed a ukulele. On the left here we have a lute probably also made by Mr. Dolmetsch in the early 20th century and on the right we have a traditional instrument. So this in its form as it is here is from Wales. This is a kruth, um, spelt C-R-W-T-H. Uh, but pronounced Cruth because it's Welsh. Um, this instrument was played throughout Britain and also other places on the mainland of Europe, uh, but really fell out of use after the medieval period, apart from in Wales, where it became almost like a national instrument to some degree. So it has four main playing strings. It has tied frets you can't really see there, but also has two drone strings off to the side there. And also, like the Cretan Lyra and the Gedolka from Bulgaria, it has a, one of the legs of the bridge goes right through to the back of the body, which acts as a sound post. Now, here we have some Iranian or Persian instruments. Um, to the foreground here is a borbat. Uh, a borbat is the Iranian version of the oud. It tends to have a more slender body. Also, this one only has five courses. Uh, they can have six courses as per modern oud, or they can have five courses like this example. So it has a more slender body shape, like so. It also, the body shape is also smaller relative to the neck. So the neck is a bit longer. Um, it doesn't follow the kind of rule of thirds as an oud would. Usually on an oud, the neck would be a third of the string length or scale length, but 
on a barabat. It's slightly different. It's slightly longer. Another difference is also the raised fingerboard, which Oud traditionally would not have. It would be level with the soundboard. To the left here is a kamenche, which is a bowed instrument played in many countries, but this is an Iranian version. And to the top here, you can see the bottom of a setar, which is a traditional Persian lute. We'll see more of in a bit. And here we can see a different angle of the same three instruments. You can see a much better image of the body of the setar there. And the peg box of the kamenche and also of the barabat. Here are two very similar plectrum plucked steel string instruments. Uh, to the left is a flat backed mandolin. Uh, this is of the type commonly used in South America, I believe, but it's very similar to the Portuguese and Eastern European design with the flat or slightly arched back as opposed to an Italian bowl back. On the right here we have a banduria. This is also, I believe, a South American version of the banduria. The banduria is traditionally from Spain, but it's also played in many of the former colonies of Spain, both in South America and also in the Philippines. So, starting on the left of this picture, this is a kudyapi, which is an instrument traditionally played in the Philippines and also in Malaysia and Indonesia. The lowest string will be used as a drone, the top string will have a melody played on it, on these few high frets you have here. This instrument is a Renaissance sitar, and this was previously in the Victorian Albert Museum, which we covered previously, but has now been moved to the Horny Man Museum. I'm not entirely sure of the details, but I believe this one was built in Italy, and it's a six-course version. Most of the Renaissance citterns from Northern Europe, particularly countries such as Germany, England and the Netherlands, were all four-course instruments. You can see that this one has diatonic fretting with some partial frets. This would have had very light gauge steel or brass strings. On the right here you can see a kobza, a Romanian kobza. It's also played in Hungary under the name koboz, but this one has steel strings. So this is probably a Romanian kobza. But this one has very strange stringing. This has four single strings to the left and four single strings to the right. Usually it would have four doubled courses of steel strings. And usually would be completely fretless, but this appears to have a fret here, and I'm not really sure how that would be played. Perhaps the idea is that you can then transpose the whole tuning up one tone or semitone if required. This is a Genoese mandolin, and this is an oud arbi. We'll cover those more in a bit, because there's some closer-up pictures of those. Here is the Genoese mandolin. Now, the Genoese mandolin is a strange kind of crossover instrument which occurred only for a relatively short period. It's like the more modern steel string mandolins in that it has steel strings. It has a floating bridge and it has the canted soundboard. It also has fixed metal frets for the steel strings. But it also has a parchment rose. You can see there in the, and six courses of strings in the Baroque mandolin tuning, which is from low to high G, B, E, A, D, G. And so this is kind of a transitional instrument between those two styles of mandolins. You can see here the peg box for the Kobza again and the Oud Arbi. On the left here in the background, you can see another Yuichin, or this looks more like uh, the Japanese version called a Gekin. And on the right here is a highly decorated Baroque guitar, which we'll see another close-up of later on. So here on the left is the Kobza, the Romanian Kobza. Uh, you can see very clearly here the strain stringing. Usually it would have four doubled courses of steel strings. And I've never really seen a Kobza quite like this in the way it's strung. So this really is quite unusual. On the right here is an Oud Arbi. Now the Oud Arbi is an ancient version of the oud, which is still played in parts of North Africa, uh, places like Morocco, uh, Algeria, Tunisia, etc. So the main difference you can see here is it has four courses of strings instead of the six courses of strings of a modern oud. It also, like the Borobat from Iran I was talking about earlier, does not follow that rule of thirds. So the neck is slightly longer and the body slightly smaller. 
the body of this Ud Arabi is slightly narrower as well, but they also tend to come in kind of rounder sizes and shapes like the standard Ud as well. Another major difference between an Ud Arabi and an Ud Sharki, which is the standard type of Ud. Uh, Sharki, by the way, means from the east, I believe, in Arabic. Uh, another difference is this carved rosettes or carved roses in the sound holes. Much like a historical European lute in many ways, the way it's carved. You've also got this traditional scratch plate style for the, the Risha, which is traditionally shaped in this shape, which is supposed to represent a baklava. Here is a close-up view of that Baroque guitar I was mentioning. As you can see, it's very highly decorated. Left here is the pear of the Genoese mandolin. Above that is a cavaquinho from Portugal. This, I believe, is a Central Asian tambour, the steel stringed instrument we were talking about earlier. And this is a sitar from India. Uh, this is a bowed instrument. I'm not entirely sure of the origins of that one. Uh, this is a rubab, which is a um, traditional instrument from Afghanistan. It's also played in Iran, but this looks like an Afghan one because it has the shorter neck and also more resonant strings, whereas the Iranian or Persian version would tend to have a longer neck with more tied frets, but less uh, resonant strings or sympathetic strings. Uh, this instrument here is a chikara, which is a bowed instrument from India. Uh, this one here is another pochette, the um, dancing violin I was talking about earlier. And behind that is a pontic lyre from Turkey. So we have another picture here of the Genoese mandolin, the kopza, the oud arbi, and here is the body of the tambour, and also part of the sitar. Here is a close-up of the body of the oud arbi. You can see the carved um, rose there. And here you can see how the luthier that made this has done relief carving on the rose and also inserted some some sort of precious stones, I think. In... Again, also part of the kopza, the tambour, and the sitar. And that brings us to the end of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions as ever, leave them in the comments below and I will answer them in a future video. If you would like to subscribe, that would be great. If you don't want to, that's fine too. I'm still not your mum, but I'm sure your mum is a lovely person. Mm -hmm.